Professor Terence Simongal, Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences, members of the private and public sector, other deans, directors, heads, staff, and students of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Given the occasion, I always recognize our university professors who are with us in the audience. Dr. Monica Davis, lecturer, faculty of medical sciences. Mr. Kenny Kitsing, PhD student, faculty of sports, UWI. Special, specially invited guests, members of the Open Lectures Committee, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasant good evening to everyone. I extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the Open Lectures Committee of the St. Augustine Campus of the University of the West Indies, the host of today's event. My name is Derek Chady, Chair of the Open Lectures Committee, and it is my honor to chair today's inaugural professorial lecture by Professor Bidya Sa. Professor Sa is Professor of Medical Education in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. He is the Director of the Center of Medical Sciences Education and Deputy Dean of Quality Assurance and Accreditation. He's also a very well respected well respected within and outside of the university for his academic excellence. His professorial inaugural lecture today is on Best Evidence Medical Education, BIMI, a Caribbean Perspective. Best ev Evidence Medical Education, BIMI, allows for the implementation of evidence-based methods and approaches to education in medical and health professions. It is an ethos which pushes the teacher, practitioner, and students to question what is being practiced, seek the best available research evidence, and determine its utility and application to the situation. Improving the teaching of medical healthcare professionals through BIMI is also inter integral to UN Sustainable Goals for health, good health and well-being, and also for quality education. Also, it also BM, BME, sorry, approaches aligns with UWI strategic objectives of improving the quality of teaching, learning, and student development. A professorial inaugural lecture is a momentous and esteemed occasion to recognize the excellence of an outstanding member of our academic community who have been promoted to the rank of professor. Professorship is the highest academic rank of the University of the West Indies. And the Open Lectures Committee celebrates the outstanding achievement of Professor Sa with the professorial inaugural lecture. An enormous responsibility of the St. Augustine campus is to undertake teaching, research, disseminate findings, and engage stakeholders and the public. The open lecture series is one of the many ways in which the St. Augustine campus directly addresses this mandate. The open lectures committee falls under the auspices of the campus principal's office. Campus principal Professor Rosemary Bell Antwine is currently out of the country on university business. She sends her best wishes to Professor Sa on this occasion. I'm therefore delighted to invite to the podium to bring opening remarks our acting campus principal, Professor Inder Ramnarain. Professor Ramnarain is a distinguished academic, a very passionate, student-friendly and focused administrator. Let's put our hands together and welcome our acting principal. Thank you very much, Professor Chidi, Chair of the Open Campus Lecture Series. Professor Terence Mongol, Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences. Other deans, 
heads and members of management of the UWI St. Augustine campus, Professor Bidyada Sa, Professor of Medical Education and this evening's feature speaker, staff and students of the UWI St. Augustine campus, friends and family of Professor Sa, and Professor Sa, I see your family is, is right behind you. Welcome. Our specially invited guests, members of the media, good evening, everyone. It is an honor to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Biliada Sa, who will speak on best evidence medical education, a Caribbean perspective. Firstly, Professor Sa, I would like to congratulate you officially on your appointment to the rank of professor. This appointment is a testimony of your outstanding body of academic work, extensive research accomplishments, and your track record of active involvement in the UWI community. As a regional institution, the UWI continues to emphasize the importance of our academics, producing scholarship and research relevant to the Caribbean context for the positive transformation of the Caribbean region and the wider world. The title of your presentation shows that this region has been and will, to, will continue to be the focus of your work. Thank you for upholding the mission of your UWI in your field of expertise. Professor Sir, I applaud your significant contribution to medical education in the region. There's definitely no doubt about your commitment to enhance and enrich the quality of teaching and learning across the UWI faculties of medical sciences. This is significantly vital work. I believe that quality in healthcare delivery begins with the foundation of quality medical education. Our medical professionals should be prepared to tackle complex healthcare systems. They should be ready to lead these systems in a manner that serves the best interests of patients. Therefore, ensuring that the education they receive is relevant to the context while maintaining its rigor may entail a measured approach to modifying the way medical education is delivered. I know that your presentation today will address strategies to help ensure that medical students receive the best possible education and are well prepared to meet the healthcare needs of the Caribbean population. This is excellent. I congratulate you for this. I appreciate what I perceive as your aim of medical education based in the context of healthcare systems. Your work as an educationalist and researcher will help to ensure that our UE trained medical practitioners are well equipped to serve our national and regional communities. Professor Sa, this is a significant milestone in your academic career. I believe that you fully deserve your professorial title on this platform today. Heartfelt congratulations and thank you for your distinguished work. I wish you much success as you continue to contribute to the advancement of knowledge in the discipline of medical education. Thank you to the Open Lecture Committee for organizing these lectures as a platform to celebrate the campus's new professors. It is a fitting public acknowledgement to have professors share the work that they have so passionately pursued over their careers and have earned them the title of professor. It provides an opportunity for persons in a wider campus community and general public to be exposed to the professor's field of study and current research. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say, having attended several of these lectures, and Professor Chetty, maybe all of these lectures, <laughs> they have always been very informative, and are in keeping with the university's commitment to providing an intellectually stimulating environment for its students, staff, and the general public. I'm confident that it will be no different this evening. Professor Sa, we look forward to what you have to share with us. As I close, I say thanks to you colleagues, staff, students, and the public for coming out to support the lecture series. I am pleased that so many of you have demonstrated genuine interest in this area. Please enjoy the lecture and open discussions that follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Camp Deputy Campus Principal, uh, for those kind words, and you're right. We have had four lectures, um, the Open Lectures Committee, and 
our deputy campus principal has been attending all of them. Thank you for all the support. Once again, a hand, round of applause for our deputy campus principal, and thank you for all the kind words. Music woos the heart and soul. And to set the tone for today's lecture by serenading us is Mr. Adil Vidal, a panist. Mr. Vidal is also a fourth year student of the MBBS program in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the St. Augustine campus. He's also a fitness enthusiast and a musician. Today, he will be sharing the latter talent with us as he performs a medley of songs on the steel pan. It is indeed my pleasure to invite to the stage Mr. Adel Vidal. Mr. Vidal. Dr. Masha, Dr. Masha, you are needed in the Fed Emergency Ward immediately. I said immediately. Hey, pull up the This one going and fuck up the place. Fuck up. Excellent rendition. Once again, a round of applause for Mr. Vidal. <laughs> professor Sa is a professor of medical education in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. I'm pleased, therefore, to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, Professor Terence Simongal, to introduce our featured speaker, Professor Bidia Sa. Professor Simongal has contributed significantly. <laughs> Professor Simongal, I, I do have to introduce you fully. You're a very humble person, but I, I need to say a few things about you. Professor Simongal has contributed significantly to the body of knowledge on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. 
His research and publications have been internationally recognized, and quite recently on the newspaper we have seen that you know, the good work um, Professor Simangal has been doing. He, is also, he has also served on the UWI COVID-19 Task Force and was previously chair of the Open Lectures Committee. It is my pleasure to welcome Dean Simangal to the podium to introduce our professorial inaugural speaker. Hi, hi, good evening everyone. Welcome to all of you. I would like to, um, before I begin, tell Mr. Vidil what a pleasure it is. I'll tell you what a pleasure it was for me to see your talents and listen to your talents. Thank you very much on behalf of Prof. Sa, but also on behalf of this audience. So, uh, Professor Chedi, the chair of our Open Lectures Committee, our distinguished Professor Inda Ramnarain, Deputy Principal, and one who I have to say, we owe a debt of gratitude. I know Chidam and where Sandra isn't here, but Chidam isn't going to be happy, because Chidam was very concerned about our foreign language. And we have training, and uh, Professor Ramnarain has really helped me a lot, and I must thank him. Um, as a deputy principal, he has certainly gone a long way. Not just this faculty, but all the faculties, I have to say, but we are particularly beholden to you, sir. We, we're really grateful. Um, the, for those of you who don't know, the university takes the position that we are a multilingual university, and our graduates should be multilingual. Therefore, from September, everybody has to have done a foreign language. Uh, I would like to recognize, of course, the distinguished gentleman himself, Professor Sa, and some very distinguished honored guests. We have Mrs. Kaushalya, Mrs. Kaushalya Sa, Ms. Bhagya Sa, and Ms. Biba Sa. Can I ask you all to stand? Let's give them a round of applause because, thank you. Being married, a man like Prof. Sa is difficult. I'm not married to him, but I want to tell you, you know, it's difficult. The man is working all hours. And I know you all, it, the, the success of a professor is the success also of the family. And we want to thank you for the support that you give to him. I've never seen him as an unhappy man. He therefore must be very happy at home. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, I would like to recognize a few other of my colleagues here. I see the director of the vet school, director of the dental school. Um, of course, my colleague deans, uh, nice to see you all. Uh, other heads of department, um, I see Professor Atpaka is here. Um, those who are further in the back, please forgive me. I have press biopia, it happens with old age, so. And uh, if, I can, if, 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 if I may say the dean designate, happy. And our dean designate, Professor Sita Raman. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be breaking any protocol, so I sought permission of our acting principal. <laughs> he said he didn't give permission. <laughs> About my own. <laughs> well. Professor Tsa joined the University of the West Indies in 2008, healing from Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, where he was an assistant professor from 2003 to 2008. That's the five years before joining us. And he went to work when he joined us at the Center for Medical Sciences Education at the rank of lecturer. In August 2014, he was promoted to senior lecturer. That's his track record. Uh, but I must say that since May 2011, he has been the head of the Center for Medical Sciences Education. And from March 2018, I think his, his contributions, his, 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 his persistent and consistent high-level contributions were recognized when he was made Deputy Dean for quality assurance and accreditation in our faculty. And to tell you a little bit about his background, he has a PhD in education 
an MA in education and a master's in philosophy in education as well, all from Kurukshetra University in Haryana, India. Kurukshetra is the birthplace of the great Hindu epic, the Bhagavad Gita, where the great battle of Marbarat was fought. I don't know all these things I asked him before. I just want to tell you. <laughs> he is steeped in his history, which he's proud of, and he should be. He had a great time there learning how to be independent, he tells me. He has obtained his BA. He did that in 1994 in education from Sambalpur University in Orissa, India, which is where he was born and where he grew up. He was born to one Premananda Sa and Priyabhati Sa, his mother, now deceased. He describes Orissa as an education and industry hub in India and feels that he really became interested in an academic career there. I tell you a bit about his background so you understand that one of the, we are now an internationally ranked university. We pride ourselves in having staff members who are not just from Trinidad and Tobago or the Caribbean, but international, international academics. We hope that in so doing, our students, as they get their education at the university, begin to understand how people from other areas and other regions think. Very important when you are from an, a small island developing country, where the opportunities for interaction with people who think differently are not as great. A little bit of the contributions of Professor Sa to this faculty. He's a crucial member of the education team in the Faculty of Medical Sciences across all the campuses, not just here. He currently provides advice to all five schools in this faculty at St. Augustine on assessment and curriculum development. He also assists schools in their quality assurance and accreditation exercises and supervises research projects, research projects at undergraduate and graduate levels. He was chair of the assessment subcommittee. Now I'm going to use a bit of jargon here, but let me just explain the jargon. When our accrediting body came to see us in CAMHP, that is, Caribbean Accreditation Authority, etc., in 2016, they were a bit unimpressed with the fact that though we are supposed to be delivering one medical curriculum, we appear to be making decisions individually as campuses. Now, the ordinances of the university guarantees the independence of the faculty board in making decisions on curriculum and assessment matters, which are then presented to the campus by our academic board. We could, not design the we could not design a mechanism to violate that. So we had to design a mechanism of consultation through which we agreed to be bound. So that is where we created the University Undergraduate Medical Curriculum Committee, which had several subcommittees, the most important important of which, in my view, was the assessment subcommittee, because assessment is the key, which Professor Saar chaired for several years, about four years, I think, in all. And there, he made contributions to all the campuses. And I want to quote the Dean of Mona when Professor Saar was up for professorship at the University Appointments Committee. He said, he makes such contributions to Mona, sometimes I think he's a member of our staff. No, I tell you, no better, no better statement could be made about an academic within the University of the West Indies. I'll give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> but such is his dedication. And the current dean at Mona told me she feels so happy to have Professor Sa on the Harmonization Subcommittee, which is another subcommittee of the of the, of the curriculum committee I mentioned because of the strength of his contributions. So he has made a number of contributions, signal contributions to the development and growth of the faculty, especially since our last accreditation. In spite of all of this, he has 50 peer-reviewed publications, one book chapter, and one book. His publications in the area of assessment have been instrumental in changing assessment modalities throughout the faculty on all the campuses. 
with emphasis now on progressive disclosure questions. Very important in clinical practice. That's how we practice, actually. And clinical scenario MCQs. He has 24 position papers that have assisted the faculty across all three campuses in streamlining assessment issues, which he has himself supervised in his position of chair of the Intercampus Committee I mentioned. Another interest where Bidia, or Bidia as I fondly refer to him, he told me he doesn't mind when I call him that, has made an original contribution is in the area of empathy and emotional intelligence. His contributions in this area have helped to strengthen the professional ethics and communication training that we do in the faculty for all our students, not just medical students. Because in a professional school, communication and emotional intelligence are extremely important in how we interact with the public. It is an area that continues to challenge us. I don't know how many students we have here or, or young doctors. The hardened practitioners already know this. But the key thing in clinical practice is not how much you know you know. Any good professional tells you a good practitioner, a good professional in any field is the person who makes the best use of what he or she knows. But to have a satisfied customer in the health sciences requires you to communicate and communicate appropriately. And this is why I must thank the founding fathers of this fathers of this faculty who had the foresight to create a center for medical sciences education. One of the issues that's face, that face us nowadays, I have to keep my finger there, you know, because the, the, the thing goes off, the screen goes off. And Professor, I'm sorry, I, I had my typed version, but I forgot it when uh, Professor Chedi called me to hurry me up. <laughs> I got a little kind of flustered. But lucky thing I backed up, I have my backup here on my cell phone. Um, yeah. What is the doctor of the field? So medical education, you see, the, the faculty of medical sciences is concerned about the healthcare professional of the future. Professional practice today in the RHEs, the vet, vet hospital, dental you know, services, on the nursing wards, is concerned with the care of the patient of today. Sometimes that prevents a little bit, causes a bit of, a, of conflict. But the issue in education is the doctor of the future. Now, if you look at the way medical practice is becoming mechanized and the, the effect of machines, so many things are being done now independent of the human being. Therefore, what makes our contribution unique as practitioners is always going to be our emotional intelligence. That's the one thing that the machines will take quite a while to catch up on, according to my reading, though I'm not an expert in the area. And that's why Professor Saar's interest in emotional intelligence is so important for this faculty. And I'm so pleased that he has pursued it. He has made several contributions on the campus as well. He was, for example, he was on the Ethics Committee for seven years, the Campus Ethics Committee. He has helped to build the reputation of UWI through his contributions to the Caribbean Accreditation Authority even in Abu Dhabi, he has contributed away well, as well, Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, but also to the Accreditation Council of Trinidad and Tobago. In addition to all of this, he's editor of the cross-campus newsletter, Medulink. Through his work in assessment, Professor Sahl has brought academic leadership to the Faculty of Medical Sciences across all campuses via his workshops and, 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 and assessment workshops in particular, but also the fact that he has been a very approachable person and people feel comfortable and happy to speak to him. And I, I know that he, of course we had a little discussion before, so I know he was going to tell you all a bit more about this. But I want to tie up a lot of things here. I said that we are looking in education at the professional of the future. I said, I spoke about the importance, spoke about the importance of emotional intelligence. So if, if that component or that contribution is important, might it not be smart of us as it were to admit people into the faculty who have high ratings or rankings in that area, mind it. Right now, we admit people purely based on the academic score and a few other things. 
Professor Sa is the man who did the research for us in that and came up with the multiple mini interview. We at St. Augustine have pioneered it for the last few years, but we could not use it as an admission criterion because it's not been agreed to by all the campuses as yet. We are hoping that they will do so. But when the accrediting body came recently, they mentioned that. In other words, if the doctor of the future or the nurse of the future or the veterinarian of the future has to have certain qualities as we see them as teachers, then we need to ensure that the people coming in have such qualities in some way or have a basis upon which to build. That is the point we want to make. Your curriculum can do so much, you can't do everything. In the same way that you say, okay, you want bright people, so you get high academic scores. So that is a bit of a controversy, perhaps, in the minds of some people listening to what I have to say, but I have no apologies for it. I think it is the right thing to do, and I firmly believe that we will have to go there. So in summary, Professor Sa is an assessment expert in medical education where he has done extensive research. He lives his field to the hilt. And it is my esteemed pleasure to thank Professor Sa for the tremendous contributions he has made to the Faculty of Medical Sciences across all campuses. And to invite you, sir, to give us a small taste of some of the delicious things that you serve up to the faculty. Thank you so much, Dean. I'm really humble, and I will try my best to share the whatever I have. Before that, I will sip up water. <laughs> <clears throat> so, all protocol observed. My special greetings to all who are present in this auditorium, also those who have registered their presence online. So the title of my presentation is Best Evidence Medical Education, A Caribbean Perspective. I added another spice to it, a journey from high touch to high tech. So that high touch is all about what you are talking about, humanistic skill, which I will try to reflect on it. So before I start my presentation, I would start with one story here. I am sure everyone in the audience, they are aware of the story of two shoe salesmen. A company sent two salesmen to different islands to determine the market potential of their products. And both the salesmen completed their survey and they reported back. The first salesman reported that in the island, no one wears any suits, so there is no market for us. The second salesman's report, no one wears any suits, there is a huge market for us. So the moral of the story is, it is about the perspective and attitude, how you see the problem. And I would like to identify myself with the second salesman. When I landed here on 10th April 2008 in this sweet TNT, I did not know anyone, not a single person. Maybe you have the impression that there are so many Indian expertise you, uh, I must be knowing, but it is not so. I was picked up from the airport by Ms. Krishlo, then AAFMS, 
and acting registrar, Mr. Moses. So while I was in the car, Ms. Quichlo mentioned that she was expecting that me to be a very old fellow because it's medical education. <laughs> so I told her that her hypothesis was rejected. <laughs> so what happened is that when I came, I found not many publications in the area of medical education in the Caribbean. And I found it as a virgin area of, for medical education research. The other thing that most inspired me at that point of time, and now also it inspired me, is the motto engraved in the coat of arms of Trinidad and Tobago, that is, together we aspire and together we achieve. Thus, you will see most of my publications are teamwork. Then I started my journey by collaborating with colleagues and made sure medical education issues in the Caribbean were published and brought to the limelight in the international area, arena. So I will try to share about 25% of my work here because it is, I, I try to condense as much as possible, so please bear with me. So today's focus, today, focus of today's lecture is what? I will try to what is all about best evidence-based medicine and how the best evidence medical education came to the forefront. And using that context, in our Caribbean context, how we can train the humanistic skill and how we have tested it, how the non-cognitive abilities can be used as an admission criteria. And I will also talk about one of the very critical thing that is necessary in health professions and in medical education, that is critical thinking and clinical reasoning and assessment strategy to test the same. A snapshot of publications on medical education in the Caribbean during COVID-19 and how technology can enhance the medical educations and finally the future directions for Caribbean best evidence medical educations and further research where we can embark upon. So evidence-based medicine, it, is, it depends upon three things. One is clinical expertise and the research evidence and what the patient you, they wish or they values. This concept was introduced in 1996 by David Sackett. In this line, again in 1998, sorry, 96, the lecture was delivered by David Hargreaves. That is what teaching as a research-based profession and prospects and possibilities. And I would quote one of the quotation that is very critical, that's why I'm quoting it here. Both education and medicine are profoundly people-centered professions. Neither believes that helping people is a matter of simple technical applications, but rather a highly skilled process in which a sophisticated judgment matches a professional decisions to the unique needs of each client, end quote. So you can see both the area is called service area, people-centered. And with that, this best education medical practice was introduced in ME. ME is what we call Association of Medical Education in Europe in 1998. And subsequently, this concept was actually formally launched in 1999. So what is this best evidence medical education is that it is implementation by the teachers in their practice of methods and it approaches to the best available evidence. Because when you talk about medical education, research matters in medical education because it has a direct impact on teaching and learning in medicine at the bedside, at the consultancy room, and to the wider community. So we cannot ignore, it cannot be opinion based, or it cannot be just what you think that is right. It should be scientifically proved approach. So following that, when you talk about best evidence medical educations, 
that it talks about five, six things, that is quality, what is called how good is the evidence, the utility, that is called quest model, quality, utility, it is self-explanatory, I don't have to spend time here, extent, I mean to what extent the evidence is there, strength, target and finally the setting where it is going to be applied. So following this quest model, we thought that there is enough to be done in the Caribbean also. So before I go there, now I will talk about it is as my dean mentioned, it is medical education is not about only knowledge, it is more than that and it has been recommended by many professional bodies. That's how coming about the evidence. So CANMEDS, they talk about six competencies. One is communications. Communications means what? As you know, establishing professional therapeutic relationship with the patient and the families. Then professionals, professionalism about high ethical standard in your practice. Scholar, as you know, it is evident. It is about your knowledge. Now, health advocate, the physician or the health professional must be able to advocate for the betterment of the patient within and beyond the clinical environment. Manager, they should be able to manage the practice as well as their career. And they should be able to demonstrate the professional practice, professional leadership in the practice. And they should be able to collaborate with the others. When I say others, as you know, now medical profession is not about only single man job. It is sometimes you say team of doctors operate something. So it is a teamwork. They have to work with other allied health professionals. So similarly, ACGME also prescribed the same thing, but in a different language. So I don't have to repeat the same thing, but these are the different criteria, six criteria they talked about. We, uh, we, what we call, follow particularly the British model that is called General Medical Council. So they prescribe again good medical practice in same area, but they are a little bit more comprehensive about safety, quality, communication, partnership, and maintaining the trust. So the whole idea is what? It is not about all only knowledge or intelligence. It is more than that when you talk about medical or any health professionals. It talks about so many non-cognitive abilities like empathy, collaboration, professionalism, ethics, leadership, communications, ability to cope with the stress because we see that when the students come to the medical school, there are a lot of stress. Uh, tolerance, adaptability, career motivations, and honesty and integrity, which is very, very critical. So keeping those things in mind, as I just mentioned, these humanistic skills are very, very critical. And now I will start with the communications, how we try to adopt it here. So when you talk about all those things, particularly now I will focus on communication skills and empathy, which is one of the component of emotional intelligence, which the Dean was mentioning. I, will, I have some research, but I will not share it here maybe at some other, other point of time because of time. So I will basically focus on communication and empathy and how it brought change to our deep delivery. So at, we conducted a research because you know this communication skill, there is already a communication skill course. And we wanted to know how the students, they are expected us to teach. And we found what? that the Caribbean students, because we wanted to catch in the first year itself. So we explore what the students, they love to get into involved in the interactive lectures and small group discussion, because that helps in the, what we call learning the communication skills better. One of the other thing is, as I was talking about high touch, this is a very interesting topic, nonverbal non communication in the Caribbean medical school, touch is a touchy issue. So what happened here is that we have the communication skills and we have been teaching and following the models of nonverbal behavior followed by European or American or Canadian model. And our tutors and students, 
observe that those skills advocated these approaches did not fit into our Caribbean context, our Caribbean culture. So what happened here, to what extent this Caribbean cultures fit into this? We tried to conduct a research and found what, you will be surprised to know the findings, what is that? There is called touch, is a very nonverbal behavior, proximity, eye contact. So all these behavior seems to be very invasive. They perceive as a invasive in different Caribbean countries. Though when you talk about this thing, particularly Barbados, open, Tinder, open, no problem with the non-barbar behavior of the, whatever the behavior you demonstrate. When it comes to Jamaica, male and male touching, whether it is physician or patient, is very, very regulated and restricted. So when you are going to practice in Jamaica, you should be very mindful how you are behaving. Now, another thing is that Within Trinidad and Tobago, when you go to Tobago, there is also called what we call eye contact. But in Tobago, if you are having an eye contact with the patient, it is considered as a disrespect. But whereas the principles of nonverbal communication is saying that when you are having the eye contact with the patient, you are reassuring the patient, you are winning the faith of the patient when you are communicating through eye but it is perceived as a different thing. Again, when it comes to Bahamas and Jamaica, if you get close proximities to the patient, again, it is considered as very, very invasive. So because as you know, as a regional university, we have students from all the different Caribbean islands. So we have to be fitting into the, all the requirement. So based on this research, the faculty dovetail their approach to teaching communication skills course with the student's preference. Then, based on the feedback of the students, the teaching of communication skill was made more culturally relevant to the Caribbean context, to a diversified multicultural class of medical students, not just following what is followed in the Europe or American. Now, coming to here, empathy. Next. This is a very, very sensitive issue when you talk about empathy, because there is abundant research. It has been established that empathy as a humanistic skill, it does impact the doctor-patient relationship. Empathy is one of the cardinal component of physician-patient relationship. And it, it, it always delivers the patient outcomes, improve patient satisfaction, even the lower, <coughs> sorry, lower malpractice liability. So why? We conducted a series of research on this topic, empathy, so that we can establish what is the level of empathy among our health professional students, and we can nurture them accordingly. So before I go into the, my research, when you say empathy, empathy is about the connection, how you establish the connection. But when you talk about sympathy, sympathy somehow drives disconnection. It is about the perspective taking when you talk about empathy means you are taking the perspective of an another person and you are staying out of judgment, non-judgmental, which it is very difficult. So keeping in those things in mind, we conducted a series of research. We can see that first in our research, in the first year students we conducted, then we conduct first year students for across, the faculty, across the faculty, all the school, then we conducted another research here only for MBBS from year one to year two, sorry, year five. Then again, we conducted for all the school, exploring the self-esteem, emotional intelligence, and all. Besides that, we also conducted another research at the international level within Malaysian Public Medical School, Defense Medical School. And finally, we wrote a treatise that whether empathy could be taught, learned, and assessed. So the summary of my finding is what? What I can tell you that in year one, we tested at two points of time, and while they enter the medical school, and when they finish the year one, second semester. And you will be surprised to know that the empathy was declining. When they enter, it was high, and when it, they, they exit year one, it was low. So there was a declining trend. 
So we thought it may be some other region. Then we conducted from year, year one to year five. But the similarly, the decline trend is there. From when they go to the year five, there is a drastic decline of level of empathy among the students. And but it is also pertinent to mention that the female are more empathetic than the male. So that is one of the very interesting finding. So other thing what we found is that the empathy level of different groups of students, it varies from the different uh, subgroups. So particularly when you talk about these things, empathy, what we found that whether it could be taught, but the reason behind the decline of empathy, there are so many reasons. It may be the teaching learning approach, it may be the culture, it may be the so many other factors are there. And we try to introduce another variable to it that is called self-esteem because these type of variables are hardly studied on health professional students in the Caribbean. So we try to explore this possibility what is going on with our students. And again, a substantial percentage of students are having low self-esteem because as you know, low self-esteem is linked to depression, suicide and so many other negative emotions. And as a health profession students, if they experience low self-esteem, it may result in high level of stress and increased risk of, risks of psychopathology. So as we see, there is a significant percentage of about 21% of our health professional students across the faculty, they experience low level of self-esteem. And again, we found this uh, little bit of relationship between what we call emotional intelligence, self-esteem, and empathy. So the whole idea behind is that what, whether this could be taught, this could be learned, or this could be assessed. Yes, the trend of declining empathy during the medical school from year one to year five, it is a established trend across the world. Not different, but what we have to do to strengthen it. Now, there are, we, what we did here is that uh, subsequently, I will come back to this slide, the impact is what one working group was formed in 2014 and subsequently the communication skills course was replaced with the PEC, that is professionalism, ethics, and communication in health courses. Then instead of teaching in year one only, it was spread throughout the program. And now we have introduced in the clinical years also. So this is the impact of our research what we did about empathy and how we are trying to nurture in our medical faculty. Now coming to another aspect, what we call social accountability, which is a very, very burning topic in the medical education, because why? The social accountability, it is now going to be possibly a new criteria for accreditations in the health professional program. So we try to establish, so trying to be proactive here to gauge what is going on with our students, what, whether they understand the social accountability or not. We try to conduct a research. This is actually will be surprised to know that this was published in peer review journal and it is in year three, our group of students research. So what we found here is that about 69% of our students, they understand the concept of social accountability. They have a positive attitude towards the concept and that percentage is very high, 82%. They are very much positive about social accountability and about significant percentage of students, they believe that the faculty demonstrates the readiness of the social accountability through its curriculum and through its activities. And besides that, I would like to register here that faculty also already working on it, how to strengthen it further this dimension by establishing different task force. Besides that, I would like to talk about the next one, what is that is futuristic non-cognitive. So when we find all those things, talking about communication skill, empathy, professionalism, social accountability. Now, we proposed how it could be included as an admission criteria in the in MMI. So admission to medical school, it is very high stake decision. Once admitted, 
if there is student's failure, it results in huge loss of finance as well as resources. It also jeopardizes the career of the candidate. Now, admission to medical school when you are reticent to fail the students and producing substandard graduate, also you are creating problem for the your end users, that is community, or you are compromising with the unsafe practice. Most important thing I will try to draw your attention here, our accreditation body speaks clearly here. Medical school must select, must. I would like to emphasize here the term must here. You can see they must select the students who process the intelligence, who, who possess the intelligence, which already we establish it through our equip. But also they talk about what integrity, personal and emotional characteristics necessary to become the effective physicians. So this is the clear guideline from the CAM HP. So again, further as I was mentioning, there are so many in-house surveys when we do the students advising and we see that FMS students do fight with the stress. So following that, again, I would like to say medical school across the world, they select the candidate based on the three general domain, academic ability, aptitude for medical school and medicines, and non-academic attribute considered desirable in the health professionals. So following that, we produced a position paper whether it could be implemented or here or not. And the position paper was fully evidence-based and it was deliberated at the faculty level, at the cross-campus level. And finally, we successfully implemented this. What is that? Multiple mini interview. What is this multiple mini interview? Multiple mini interview is a technique where an applicant completes several mini interview in short successions. And what is that happen in that interviews? The students or the candidate will be presented with some scenarios and they have to give responses and the responses are predetermined and candidates will be rotating through different stations. Just as you see, uh, and this was actually first introduced in 2004 by the McMaster University and it is widely used in Canada, UK, Australia, USA and Asia. Not only in undergraduate program but also in postgraduate studies and residencies and it is widely acceptable and feasible. So it could be what face to face and virtual. But so based on the position paper presented the dean formed a task force and the task force engaged with the development of the scenario. We prepared the blueprint highlighting the different non-cognitive ability, communication skill, ethical issues, problem solving, integrity, teamwork and rigorous processes were followed while developing the scenarios, developing the clinical scenario developing because we have to keep in mind that they are not the medical students, they are just the high school graduates. And we develop the rating skills, everything, and finally what? We first online MMI was conducted as a pilot with 39 students when we are taking the first set of January students. You can see how you are trying to model, I mean trying to pilot with the first cohort of January students. But we successfully conducted it. Subsequently, we conducted in September 2021 with 152 students. And these students are already admitted to year one because we could not find the, them before them. Now again, September 2022, we conducted with 153 students. So we can see that how massive this exercise was. 64 interviewer, 35 technical staff, the 54 interviewer, 25 technical staff, 31 interviewers and 18 technical staff in the different years. And they did not just come so, they were given proper training to interview our students. So what I am trying to say is that this is what we call about medical, evidence-based medical education. We produced the paper, we, have, we provided the evidence, we gave the proper training to our staff and trying to implement. 
the recommendation is already forwarded to the cross campus committee of dean and is under considerations and this has been replicated from the in the kbil as well as mona campus with the support of the st augustine campus now coming to the other aspect when you talk about the medical curriculum students feel overburdened you can see overflowing of the knowledge and information to their mind so when you talk about that one of the very critical aspect is the critical thinking and clinical reasoning we did a book chapter with one of uh, my fellow medical education director in kbil dr majumdar so that book chapter was very very really intriguing when we try to explore what is going on with that so what happen is that clinical and critical thinking when you talk about critical thinking what is that because this is a very very sensitive and necessary criteria in the medical school because it leads to if there is no proper critical thinking and clinical reasoning it may lead to cognitive biases so before i talk about that i would like to highlight that here critical thinking and clinical reasoning they are the cornerstone of teaching and learning in 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 the training of the future doctors lack of critical thinking and lack of clinical reasoning in medical curricular it causes as i mentioned cognitive biases and this thing has been there in for long time in all the traditions where we talk about african traditions arabic tradition chinese traditions indian traditions they all talk about the critical and clinical reasoning in the medicine so i would like to just quote one thing one of the very prehistoric ayurveda physician charaka who was a physician 300 bc what he said is about the clinical thinking you can see that at that point of also they had already emphasized the clinical thinking and critical reasoning in the medicines what they did discussion on court discussion with specialists promotes pursuit and advancement of knowledge provides dexterity improves power of speaking illumines fame removes doubt in in confidence in case sorry in in scriptures if any by repeating the topic and creates confidence in case there is any doubt and brings forth new ideas the idea memorized in study from the teacher will be firm when applied in competitive discussion so you can see that they are talking about memorized in the study from the teacher because at that time they used to memory memorize everything and this quotation was in sanskrit it has been translated into english now so the whole idea is that the concept of critical thinking and clinical reasoning is there since time immemorial in all the tradition whether name it arabic african indian chinese and all so what is the best thing is that what when you are lacking about this critical thinking it causes cognitive biases and one of the studies found that this cognitive biases leads to what diagnostic error in the later professional practice and this diagnostic error estimated to be 10 to 15% in the clinical decision making it has been established by the high level research conducted by national academy of science engineering and medicine in 2015 and in usa itself the clinical errors were estimated to cause 250000 deaths per year as reported by mercury and daniel in 2016 now you may be surprised again that analysis of data over 23000 of malpractice cases prepared by crico that is one of the insurance agencies in us found that 20% of the total cases out of 23000 were attributed to the diagnostic errors and out of that 20% 73% of these diagnostics errors were due to the identifiable identifiable lapses in the clinical reasoning now it is not about that clinical or cognitive biases it has a financial implication also an analysis of the 25 year from 1986 to 
it explored that the diagnostic error the claim found to be more than 38 billion dollar another very interesting facts are here one study was conducted in 2017 and what they found is that they surveyed 91 medical school and in nine, out of 91 medical school 57 percent of the medical school they lack this dedicated session on critical thinking and clinical reasoning in 29 percent of the medical school the students are having poor clinical reasoning understanding of the concept 55 percent of the medical school out of 91 fair knowledge of the different concept involved in the clinical reasoning and a significant percentage of the medical school like 88 lack dedicated curricular time allocated for that purpose and even the faculty expertise also they lack giving training to their students so can it be taught can it be learned or can it be assessed yes wow because evidence has shows that critical thinkers have better decision making problem solving and are professionally more competent and confident and just a reminder for our colleagues here also that critical thinking is one of our ue distinctive characteristics of graduates so there is a need for ongoing faculty development opportunities so that they develop the comprehensive understanding of the concept first the faculty must understand that and this could be done particularly when you are talking about simulation problem based learning and so many other teaching learning strategies brainstorming which we already do i am coming there why i am talking about this so these keeping in this thing also again further if you go we have presented so many policy and position paper i will just highlight few of them one is what we call progressive disclosure question clinical scenario 12 principles of assessment in fms assessment feedback and it is pertinent to note that all these position paper when you introduce they were supported by the staff training through workshop and consultations so why I am talking about particularly this thing, what we just talked about the clinical thinking and critical thinking, this way we can assess in a better way. So what happened, this critical thinking, to test that what we did, we, as I say, a comparison of clinical scenario and versus standalone questions in the problem based learning. And for your uh, just gentle information of the audience those who are out of medical faculty. Our FMS is unique about that is it is based on the problem based learning. And what is that problem based learning? Students are thrown into the problem and they discuss, they demonstrate, they, they brainstorm and they come out with the solutions of their own with the facilitation provided by the tutor, which promotes what we are talking about critical thinking and clinical reasoning but we are training them but we have to find a way to assess them so this is one of the thing we found what we call whether we, we particularly in the phase one i am talking about because ultimately in the clinical science in clinical years we are bound to give the clinical scenario but in the phase one when i say phase one i am talking about the preclinical years we have to set our exam in a clinical scenario so that we can test what we are supposed to test about the critical thinking and clinical reasoning. So we conducted this study and the finding was very interesting. What we found here is that the clinical scenario was very favorable and it also facilitated the integration of the subspecialties because you can imagine that in the paraclinical there are so many subspecialties anatomical pathology, clinic chemical pathology, hematology, immunology, microbiology, pharmacology. So all those things need to be integrated. So this is the best way where we can integrate the, all the things and ask the question and test the way in line with the PBL philosophy. And also we found that the difficulty level promoted by this clinical scenario 
is multi-logical and it also promotes critical thinking. And also we found that students are scoring better means it means they are having a better understanding of the material. Subsequently, as I say, other study was conducted about progressive disclosure because as the case evolves, the questions are asked. So this also we found what, again, it is a very good approach to ask questions on multiple specialties. And we found that it gives a great opportunity to test the higher level of learning. Again, when you talk about higher level of learning, it is about the critical thinking and clinical reasoning. Further, based on the principle, we try to see whether there is multiple modal assessment works or not. We conducted a study again here, and what we found is that multiple modes of assessment are very critical for adequate and fair assessment of the knowledge, and also that continuous assessment encourages students to work consistently throughout the course. Subsequently, another study we conducted here about pre-testing as an indicator of performance in final examination among third-year medical students. And what we found here again is that the pre-testing seems to be a good predictor of the final examinations. But that is fine, but it also helped in what? Identify the gaps and help the students giving the necessary feedback so that they can do the final exam in a better way. So this is the implications of the policy position paper introduced, and these are just few examples we did. Now, another thing we found what is that sometimes there was complaint that the PBL tutors are there biased, as I was talking about cognitive bias. When you talk about cognitive bias, it is all about when you say what is cognitive bias, is that you, you, you work your intuition, you, you, you ignore the evidence, you work with the intuitions, but int intuition are not always correct. So again, this was a very interesting study. We did it for year three medical students, and we distribute the, uh, what you call students, in different groups, about 14 groups, and each group was, again, given three different types of tutors. So we want to see how they are assessing. So those who are lenient, despite their group, they are lenient in their marking, and those who are stagnant, so it means what? They are introducing cognitive biases into the assessment. They are not following the, what we call, assessment of the performance principle. So for that, we again introduce so much rigorous training to that. So these are all findings relating to what we are talking about, our policy position paper introduced and the evidence we collected in our context. And we implemented to strengthen the delivery of the medical curriculum in the faculty. And another thing very, very, very significant introduced in the medical faculty is that, because when you talk about a medical graduates, it is not about pass, pass mark. We are looking for a minimally competent graduate. And how we do it, we do it in a very established evidence that is recommended by the different medical school, different researchers. And for that, we develop the blueprint. Blueprint is fine, but the other thing is what we call standard setting. So standard setting has been introduced across the different uh, our campuses to ensure that what the graduates we are producing is they are not only pass, they are competent to treat you in an effective way, in an effective manner. Now, following that, as you know, everybody know the havoc presented by the what we call COVID-19. And this COVID-19, as you know, one thing it did to us what? It made us to think, to do the thing in a different way, alternative way. So when you talk about our medical faculty, I could firmly believe and tell you that medical faculty stands to the quotation by Darwin here, that it is not the strongest of the species that survive not the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to the change. 
and medical faculty. I understand all other faculties were there, but challenge for medical faculty was very, very unique. Because we have been very traditional way of teaching medicine, bedside teaching, laboratory, uh, clinical teaching, and all those things. And we were very much responsive to the change, and we made it. And at that point of time, uh, the WFME president, Professor Gordon, mentioned that pandemic is not a revolution in medical education. It is an opportunity how we make the education better. So what we did here is that we documented so many things in the what is going on. So the impact of medical education, sorry, impact of COVID-19 on medical education is multifaceted. It is like hydra headed. Medical research was impacted, hospital service was impacted, teaching was impacted, assessment was impacted. There was a heavy psychological impact on the students, staff, and or allied health professionals, hands-on training was impacted. So you can see, I have just listed a few, there is more than that. So all these impact and coping and delivering the students and bringing some assessment modalities and fighting in the aquac and justifying in front of our deputy principal in the committee was very hard to us, and we did it, and we did it successfully. Yes, Deputy Principal, am I right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. And that's the thing. And we documented what we experienced, and so many publications came out of it. I would just like to view the highlight here. And these are the few publications. There are so many other publications, but I just highlighted this. We documented one publication, uh, with other campus, that is cross-campus publications, with the cable campus, challenges and opportunities for preclinical -med pre medical education in COVID-19 crisis and beyond. We documented, we recommended something. Asynchronous environment, because at that time, asynchronous assessment was the buzzword. So how it could be done in our medical environment? Other thing also we talked about, one review article we published, because at that point of time, our students were going through so much stress, so how the psychophysiological effect of yoga can help in managing the stress. We ventured into the radiology education also, and its impact, we did a narrative review. These are the just few. So why I am talking about this thing? These, we documented the best practice, published in the International Journal of Medical Education. And all these articles are now by well cited, which validates what we are doing in the Caribbean medical education is of international standards. Now, I am talking to the next page, what is that technology enhanced medical education. That is now we are talking about, which is hybrid, mobile first, mixed reality, open access, collaborative, up-to-date, AI, game-based, global. I'm coming to the here. I'll just show how the technology has been in integrated and some of the strategy we already have implemented in our medical faculty. There are so many integration of technology we can do through virtual lab, digital caravers, and virtual anatomy, remote simulations. These are all self-explanatory, virtual, teaching round, clinical supervision through phone, over phone or telemedicine, dissemination of electronic images via PACS, which is done by radiology teaching in our faculty. Uh, also, we have what we call, the other thing is about, uh, sorry, the most talked about is our artificial intelligence. And it is influencing every single field of human inquiry. And on April 11, 2023, I came across a document, like chat GPT, there were about, as of April 11th, there were about 381 tools for various fields, starting from transportation to content creation to law, and is very much well established as a research area, particularly in the health professions. 
and artificial intelligence in changing the medicine and it will relieve physicians from the burden of root knowledge. Why I am saying so? Because the knowledge in medical field is growing exponentially. How? I'll just give you one example here. In 1950s, it used to take 50 years to develop the knowledge. When it comes to 1980, the knowledge doubling of medical knowledge it takes seven years and by 2010 it took three and three and five three and a half years almost three and a half years to develop medical knowledge and by now in less than three months the medical knowledge is doubling up it is an estimation given by professor p denson now if you say so, in that estimation, a medical student who starts medical school this year will have as many as 20 doublings by the time he graduates. So you can imagine that how difficult it will be to take and digest all those knowledge. So in that way, if you see AI is a blessings. Because we need in future AI literate future clinicians. AI could help physicians by amalgating the large amount of data, complementing their decision making process to identify diagnosis and recommended treatment. And physicians in turn, what they have to do, they should just able to interpret the results and communicate a recommendation to the patient. That is the future of medicine. Now, there are so many applications, I can just list it. AI is already applied in healthcare domain like diagnosis and treatment, disease, medical imaging, diagnosis, drug discovery, manufacturing, personalized medicines, electronic health record. The other thing is that now clinical trial also run on AI, physical robots, it has revolutionized the particularly gynecologic prostate and even the head and neck surgeries. The most critical thing was predicting the outbreak and AI was a blessing for that. In the recent outbreak of COVID-19, AI used to predict the extent and spread of the virus. So what is the basic thing is here is that still all those things happening, but there is very, very few time dedicated for our medical students to learn these things. So, less time is spent on familiarizing the medical students, even the resident with new technologies such as AI or mobile, mobile health applications and telemedicines. Not even USMLE, USMLE for the audience in the public, that is the US licensing medical exam which is a high level exam if you want to practice or if you want to uh, study your resident you have to pass those exam so that exam also does not even test the ai in their exam so they realized very late i was talking about scgme six competencies nothing was there about it or ai so they realized that there is a need for that and they come up with the policy in 2018. And that policy is about augmented intelligence, encouraging research into how AI should be addressed in the medical education. And they are working on it. And now it is coming slowly, slowly. How? I can say there are so many institutes in different parts of the world, particularly US and Europe. They are talking about integrating artificial intelligence in the medical education, Duke Institute, University of Florida, Carl Illinois, University of Virginia, Center of Engineering and Medicine. So you can see how they are collaborating with the FST, I mean Faculty of Science and Technology and Engineering with the medicines. So this is a way to go. Now, future directions, further strengthen the training of the humanistic skill while introducing the high tech in medical educations. While considering the incorporation of the non-cognitive abilities and admission criteria, EPETL implemented, our research will evaluate its impact. 
we may revisit the graduate outcomes to produce the ai literate health professionals and if we introduce those curriculum objectives we may have to also evaluate its impact partner with the international university that offers ai in medicine so students can be sent for elective purpose at least and this is another thing i was talking about as i say i could not share much of the my ai studies but we have done some ai study ai means our emotional intelligence but i would like to here collaborate with the department of psychology to conduct a research on the national and regional level at the secondary school level because you cannot fix the empathy and emotional intelligence when they come to the university first we need to establish set the things and train them from the school level so when they coming to the university they are ready for us so this is another research we would like to embark upon we also looking for formal interfaculty we have a collaboration already with the faa with some of the projects fhc with the language so we are looking for some collaboration with the fst or faculty of engineering also where there should be collaborative like computer science and all those things with our medicine introduce it with that i end my presentation thank you very much to be very patient listener uh after the end of the my presentations i would like to just bow some of the gratitude some of the thanks the support i received first i would like to bow before my heavenly mother for our blessings my heart felt gratitude to my father and family members my mentor dr patel from india i would like to express my gratitude for all the support that whatever activities we have been doing in the faculty current dean professor simangal and what i used to do and for the moral support former dean professor emirates professor ram sevak professor ajanwaka for the moral support i received from professor narayan singh professor tilak singh professor adoga from retired professor from our veterinary school dr suresh rao and former colleagues mrs stella williams and mrs debra pichlo former a dean of his fms i could not have reached here without the support of all secretarial and technical staff my colleagues at the cmse special thanks to you all my research colleagues across the campus particularly dr majumdar director medical educations from the kevil campus all participants unknown participants in our research projects without their support we might not have produced this whatever research we have produced here and last but not the least all wonderful audience for their patient hearing in the hall as well as online thank you very much uh now i would like to invite uh dr monica davis who is a medical practitioner physiologist with keen interest in the field of personal health and stress management and well-being and resilience and global sustainability to the podium to moderate the sessions dr davis thank you so much Thank you Professor Sa for a really interesting presentation. Are you all hearing me? Is it working? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. And um first of all I, I well I also would like to thank you for 
the support you, you gave at our very difficult ACWAC meetings. Thank you. You know, we had persons who said that this is the way they have done it and they will always do it no matter what. And, and um, thank you for your intervention. I'm really interested in this multiple mini interviews that you would have introduced. No, you have. We're not in the plan. Yeah, well, piloted. Yeah, yeah piloting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have been piloting, piloting these interviews for a couple of years now. Yeah. Have you looked at the results of? Yes. Um, we, could you share with us some of the results? Yes. And it is very interesting. And what I could say that is that uh, there are different patterns of uh, responses to the different scenario we present. And we have, actually we are writing a paper on it now, it is in the process. And let me talk about the feedback from the interviewer, the students. The feedback is very strong. In all the three interviews we conducted MMI, about 90% plus interviewers support that, even the technical staff they see a value in it, and even the students. We did a, I should say, we did a multi-source feedback from the staff, from the students, from the facilitator, I mean technical staff, and from the IT staff also. And it was very positive. And when you talk about, we are, we are looking into how we can correlate into the academic score, and we are in the process of getting the data. We are in the process of getting the data, and there is also one another issue here when you are talking about MMI. We have to reach to a consensus what will be the pass mark. That it needs to be determined so that we can say, okay, this is a pass mark. How, what type of pass mark? Because as of now, we are talking about 50% pass mark. So when we do that, we see that in our uh, blueprint, there are seven stations. So in those seven stations, there are some students, those who fail the integrity following the 50% pass mark. There are some students, those who fail in the communication skill. There are some students, those who fail in the, what we call uh, other skills, other areas, problem solving ability. So those things need to be detailed when we try to see, get the other information about the academic score in the KIP and we try to see the relationship between them, and it is in the process. Yeah. So with those seven areas that you, you examine during these MMIs, I noticed that integrity carries only 5% of the marks, and empathy carries, again, only 5%. Yeah. I wondered why so low, because I thought those would be really important for Yeah, for point taken, Prof, and we, because it is a, in the process now, it is a process, I mean, work in progress, and we'll deliberate, the working group will deliberate, and your point is taken, how we can see how it can, how it can be addressed. Okay, thank you. I do have one more question, may I? Certainly. Okay, so I, I know the faculty does a really good job in producing quality medical graduates, but when a recent graduate goes out there as an intern or even as a, a junior doctor in the public healthcare systems, when they are made to work 24-hour shifts, 36-hour shifts, 38 hours recently, yeah, I, yeah. I know of a case. Doesn't that lead to problems, possible problems in, in performance when someone has to spend such a long time in, in a single shift? Yeah, it does, but uh, I, I, will, uh, the, I will pass that question to my dean. <laughs> I would like to hear from you, Dean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so this is well documented. Uh, in fact, American doctors worked a minimum of 80 hours a week. And when I went to the UK in 1993, uh, we had weekends where we would work over 100 hours, um, or weeks when we worked that because of the on calls and so on. Uh, but when, uh, so, so the Royal College of Physicians looked at that and said, no, you shouldn't do it that way. You should work at most 12 or 14 hours in succession. Now, the healthcare system in Trinidad has said that in a 24-hour period, you should work 16 hours maximum. So you either work eight to four, you work eight to four, and then you either work a four to 12 shift or a 12 to eight shift in a 24-hour period. And then you have a normal 12-hour 
uh, sorry, eight hour day on the next day. Um, that is the rule. Now, if you observe people doing it and they tell you people are making them do it, that is unfortunately not true. That is a, some sort of arrangement that some units make in order to get around whatever work days they decide to have. But it is not, uh, it is not, it has not been agreed to between any union and the government. The agreement is you have a eight eight hour normal shift, normal working, plus another eight hours on call. And that should happen no more than seven times a month. And that's what people are paid for. But in answer to your question, if people do work 36 and 38 hours, yes, uh, there is fatigue and the, the, the research has shown that there's a loss of concentration and a greater risk of medical error. Okay, so then it is happening now. Thank well, you. if it is happening now, I'm saying it is not an approved process. It is people doing some sort of shortcut themselves that should not be occurring. So complaints should be made to the relevant CEOs. Most likely they don't even know it. If, if I may um, continue to address your question, um, in a lot of cases it is the excess hours spent will be because your shift, it doesn't mean that when your shift ends you stop caring for the patient. So the patient may have just come in as your shift is ending and it could be a complex patient and you have to spend hours and hours dealing with that patient. You cannot just say, okay, my shift is off, I'm gone. Because then you'll get into real trouble. So you have to finish and sometimes depending on the level of of illness of the patient, you also have to stay to observe to make sure that what you did was good before you hand over to your superiors. I know that for a fact too. No, and I know no, you're speaking from experience, yeah, what you're Deputy. Saying, what you're saying is a voluntary thing. The healthcare system works like this. You're quite right. A patient comes in, yes, you need to see them off. Following that is a normal work day in which you will work eight to four. Mm -hmm. If you choose to see about the patient after that, that is your choice. The healthcare system has an on-call team and you're supposed to hand over to them. You may choose not to do so because then you don't want them to do you that at some other time in the future. But that's a personal decision. But you can't blame it on the healthcare system for that. They are, you see, our system is designed to work properly. A lot of people do not take the time to understand the system and make all sorts of shortcuts which lead to a lot of chaos. And I have to say that part of the reason that's allowed to survive is because the consultants, us, do not supervise it carefully. If you do that, the system works properly, but we need to supervise it, and we have to take the responsibility for doing that. When I was an intern, for example, I worked with one consultant who explained that when you come in on the weekend and you do a ward run that's not, in, that's not scheduled because it's a 40-hour work week, then you should get a half day off during the week. But it only works if people don't decide, okay, we finished ward work and we're running home. Somebody has to stay back and manage the ward. Very few people do that. They want to finish their work and run home or run away. There's a responsibility that's put on you as a healthcare professional that we all need to live up to. And if we have to cover our wards from eight to four, that's what we have to do. And we don't run off. That's part of the issue, I'm afraid. For the sake of not prolonging the argument, we will leave it there from our erudite dean. Um, I'm sure there are other views on that, but are there any other questions or anything else? Thank you very much, Deputy Principal, for your question. Questions. I'm not seeing any hands up. Oh, there's one. <laughs> Professor William Smith, of whom I'm well proud. Thanks. Thank you for that presentation. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Professor Sir, thank you. Um, you mentioned <laughs> low self-esteem, high rates of low self-esteem in the undergraduates um, at the faculty. And I wondered if, has anybody looked at the impact of social media or the consumption of social media on self-esteem? Because I know there's some research coming out that drew a parallel between the proliferation of TikTok yeah in the US as the most popular social media app and the subsequent parallel rise in mental health issues with younger populations that consume social media. So I wondered if there's any yeah. research in that area. No, we have not done any such research actually and that may be a way to think about and we can 
explore the possibilities what is going on their social media so but as you see you're right because self esteem is uh, highly impacted by the use of social media that is that, that is their evidence is there but we have not seen in our students populations and we can look for it and our psychologist is here and we can collaborate and see how it can be conducted use of social media on the psychological effect of health professional students I just want to corroborate what you are saying, though, um, Professor Smith, because I happen to have supervised two groups, actually, who did similar studies to that about the consumption of social media and its relation to mental health. And it was a definite correlation between people who complained of sleeplessness, complained of distraction, complained of stress, they just couldn't cope anymore. Um, and it, was, it, was, it redounded to the um, excess social media. And other occasions, too, it has been shown that um, if people are guided to monitor themselves to say 30 minutes per day for media and also not watching negative stuff and all of those kinds of things but it would be good if uh, you know really a large cohort because this was just done with year one and two students basically so that's good yes sir professor Tilak Singh so Bidya, thank thank you very much for a delightful talk it's not unnatural when exposed repeatedly to a stimulus for you to develop some tolerance. I'm not totally surprised that empathy declines as a student progresses through a harrowing experience. What is more important is not the declining empathy, but the prevalence of lack of empathy. Have you been able to ascertain what how commonly that exists among medical students, the lack of empathy, and, and, and therefore a revelation of antisocial personalities and other disorders that you could pick up on early and attempt to correct? We, uh, actually, Prof, that's a good point, but we have not conducted any research about lack of empathy among the medical students. Because we just, I just say there is a overall cross-sectional survey we conducted and that explore the actually the trend of empathy what is going on and maybe we can think about that also uh, we try to conduct the empathy among the our medical professional practitioners but it was very difficult to get the approval from the different IRHC so it could not be successful but there also we try to see whether those as there are certain things as you say when it comes to empathy also, it has the impact about the role models the available in our health systems. It has also impact on the what type of empathy they are nurturing, our students are nurturing. And thank you for that comment, Prof. And we'll try to explore, and that is a, also we can look into it. And if I may follow on that, um, what Professor Tilak is saying, and your response. Might it not be a good idea to start those empathy or lack of empathy studies in high school, for example, in sixth form, or even in fourth form when people are deciding what type of jobs that they want to do, therefore they decide what subjects they want to take? Any idea on that, Prof? Any comment on that? Uh, no, that's why we are, we are trying to embark upon the study on the, as I say, secondary school. Mm -hmm. We are going there because, as you see, uh, I don't want to comment on that, but you see the level of the student, I mean, the if you go to the public also, let's say in the school violence, what is going on in the school level, school violence, it is because of they are not able to properly manage the emotions. That's exactly the problem. Otherwise, and in the street violence, sometimes you see that a doubles vendor is killed by somebody because just for a doubles. So it is about what? It is about the lack of managing the emotions. They are not able to properly manage the emotions. And that's why we are trying to embark upon another study, as I say, secondary school, exploring the emotional intelligence and empathy level of secondary school, which we again include the lack of empathy existence of that in the secondary school level, and try to explore at the national and regional level, and so that, as I was mentioning, it can be nurtured from their school level, so when they come to the university, we will not find any difficulty with that. Um, I see a question. Can't see who it is, though, I'm afraid. Would you mind saying your name first, please? Can't see properly. Who me? I can't yes. see, your, I can't yes. see who evening. you are. Good evening. 
Yes, I'm Shulan. Yes. Okay, Joanne. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question. It is this. Uh, you spoke about scholarship and empathy uh, being important, empathy being important for bedside manner and so forth. Does every student who does medicine want to be that kind of doctor? In other words, so for example, every person who does law doesn't necessarily end up in the courtroom. There are many, many various streams. Does every student who enters the faculty of med want to be that kind of doctor? In other words, you can have scholarship, you may lack empathy, but if you don't want to be by the patient's bed, you may still have something to offer. And if empathy is used as an admission criteria, might we not run the risk of excluding persons who don't see their career eventually at the patient's bedside? Okay, uh, your point taken. So what I was trying to say here is that the research which have been conducted, particularly looking at the empathy and the patient outcome here. And I understand that not because there are so many other career opportunities where you say that you are saying that we don't need a empathy as a characteristics, but it is not so. Empathy is required in all the professions. This is a basic requirement in all the professions. How you, because that's what I'm talking about the emotional intelligence. Emotional in, empathy is a very component of um, uh, uh, empathy is a, one of the component of emotional intelligence. And as you see, nowadays, starting from management to the law to everywhere, we need that ability to be successful in your practice, whether it is a research, whether it is a what you call practice in the field as a professionals. You know, I see Professor Simangal practically chomping at the bit, but may I take leave as I'm here just to say very quickly that the, the object of our teaching at the faculty is to produce a generalist. We don't produce specialists directly. When you come out, you have to be proficient in all areas, and then you decide what you want to do. Prof? Yeah, the, 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 um, that's a very nice question. I, I, I must confess I, I'm thinking on my feet here. I've never thought of that. Um, however, I would like to see, and I'm referring to what the colleague here um, mentioned, which is, is empathy really necessary? And just to um, go back to what a prophet, um, Ram Ryan, you mentioned this, and you said only 5% for empathy. That is not the intent here at all. Each station is looked at to see how the students performed in the station. Um, the overall weighting we still have to agree on. That was just a suggestion that Prof. Saar um, had made there, and empathy will be given a very high, high ranking. However, but to answer the question, what we are doing in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and I want to speak across all the schools here, it's not just the medical school, is to produce a healthcare professional who provides care to the society, to clients, to human beings, or in the case of the vet school, to many-legged beings. <laughs> but they still have to deal with they must have empathy because they still have to understand the feelings of the people who bring their pets in. So it is extreme, that is what we are trying to produce. Now, if people don't want to do that, there are numerous opportunities elsewhere. They could do FST medical physics. They could do occupational uh, medicine, uh, not medicine, occupational um, care, which is actually done in FST. There are other areas of engineering. Those do not require you to interact with patients. So, 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 so that facility is well known and exists elsewhere. But our goal is to produce a professional, whether in medicine or, or, or vet or dentistry, or whatever, who is able to interact with, with, with members of the public and clients in the public. Okay, so that's our goal, so it can't be any other way. Thank you, Professor Simangal. And I think to add to that, empathy should be a part of everybody. It's, it's desirable, so it doesn't matter which faculty you're in. You know. Any other questions? We are running out of time, but I think we have time. Is there somebody in the back? Hi, Prof. 
Oh, um, Marlon. <laughs> Just a quick question. Um, even empathy, you could emotional have in, intelligence. Um, you, could have, you could have asked in CMSE, Marlon, why you were asking here. OK, I'll leave it for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, OK, go ahead, go ahead. Are we taking a student who does not have the necessary emotional intelligence? Can we teach it, or is it just you don't have it, we don't you go elsewhere? No. Uh, so I will go back to the what is the our accreditation body is talking about that statement. It is talking about we have to find the candidate, those who are intelligent, having the integrity, and emotionally intelligent also, to be a successful health professionals. So once we have they have the minimum whatever we decide on, minimum criteria then we can nurture them and train them and make as we are talking as you are talking about the admission in the like academic school they have the minimum once they fulfill the minimum we are nurturing them through the medical school to be a successful graduate the similar way we can we once we decide the what will be the minimum criteria for all those non cognitive abilities not only empathy non cognitive abilities as a whole so that once we decide on that and they enter into the medical school we can nurture them through our courses, through our training, through our different type of workshop. So when they graduate, they graduate as a competent graduate. That answers your question, Marlon? Good, good, all right. I guess one, somebody might ask, um, how are you going to know which ones have and the amounts of EI that they have when, when they come in, who you need to nurture? And a lot of people, the parents tell them, you're not made for studying, you're not made for books, you're not made for this. And a lot of it has to do with the, the home grounding because you could nurture as much as you want if you don't have it happening in the home or with in the people with whom they interact, it's not gonna help. And it's gonna be very difficult to, to measure that at any point during medical school. They're not, e they're not even gonna wanna go to those classes, are they? Do we ha I think we have time for one more question, and I'm seeing a hand in the back. It looks like, is that Akpaka? Oh, Jimmy Ramda? Hi, good. Please announce, oh, oh yeah, I heard the it's, voice. It's um, Jimmy Ramdas. Professor Michael Jimmy Ramdas, yeah. Oh, you would. <laughs> um, Professor Sa, I just wanted to say, this is a fantastic lecture, I compliment you. On, on this excellent presentation. Thank you. Sir. And um, I generally don't like to ask questions, but I have one to throw a, a, a googly at you and to ask you a question about artificial intelligence because everyone talks about empathy, empathy and being a good doctor and being kind and ethical and all that. But with artificial intelligence, how do you see the future in the next 10 or 20 years and what research we could do in terms of, for exa example, chat GPT, right? And how it's used to assess medical licensing exams and medical exams and the, the AI is actually beating the human, right? Yeah. But how do you see the future and it will eventually become something in vogue i would i would assume with the way the world is going but how do you see that being incorporated with the empathy the ethics the humanoid factors yeah there is there is a thing that as i just mentioned in my presentation ai is the future of not only medicine in every field ai is trying to revolutionize everything so that's the thing I added a title that what we call high touch to high tech. So it cannot be the, the, the humanistic skill. This will be the, along with the AI, whatever training we need to give to, to, to bring the AI literate physicians or health professionals. Along with that, this role of humanistic training of the humanistic skill is paramount because this is the, the, the role, real role of the doctor in future because all the whatever the, you can talk about the amalgamation of the information, 
the prescription and everything though it will be trans information will be transferred by the physicians to the patient so at that point of time the role of humanistic skill cannot be ignored whatever ai we do that's why it is paramount and attached with there good so seven is said to be a lucky number and we've had seven questions so i think we should let the luck those of you who believe in luck you know i think you've had seven questions and you've done very well with your seven questions professor sir i don't think we should burden you any more Thank you very much for the participation of the audience. I gather we didn't have anything from online, so I hand over to Professor Chidi. Well, once again, a round of applause for Professor Sa and our moderator, Dr. Davis. It was a wonderful presentation. In fact, I heard uh, you know, it's a multidisciplinary approach, and I can see many faculties um, and disciplines benefiting from BME. I can, uh, you mentioned psychology, and much of what you said about empathy, self-esteem, um, intersects with the area that you have spoken about. But it's much more than his presentation on self-esteem and empathy. It's a really broad approach that he took. You know, very um, covered a span of area. And I, once again, a round of applause for <laughs> Professor Sa. Excellent. At this point, I'd like to invite our acting campus principal, Professor Inder Ramnarain, to present on behalf of the Open Lectures Committee to Professor Sa a token of our appreciation. Let me invite both Professor Sa and Professor Inder Ramnarain to come to the stage. Please, yeah. Thank you both very much. <laughs> So as we bear closer to the end of this evening's proceedings, I'd like to invite Mr. Kenny Kitsing to deliver the vote of thanks. Mr. Kitsing is currently pursuing his PhD at the Faculty of Sport at our Mona campus under the supervision of Professor Sa. Mr. Mr. Kitsing has also taught at the School of Education, St. Augustine campus for the past six years in also in addition to lecturing in programs at the Faculty of Sports at, as well as the Open Campus. So it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Kenny Kitson to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the University of the West Indies and Augustine and the Open Lectures Committee, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who has made this professional inaugural lecture a great success. First, I would like to thank the Chair, Professor Chidi, for his warm welcome and opening remarks. We are grateful for his support and guidance throughout the planning process. Professor Sir, who we recognize today, we want to express our sincere gratitude for your captivating feature presentation and the valuable insights and expertise you shared in the field of medical sciences education. Your lecture served as a testament to your extensive knowledge and proficiency in the field, and we are honored to have you as a distinguished, distinguished member of our academic community. Your continued contributions will undoubtedly enhance our community. And we are excited 
to see forthcoming milestones and achievements you will accomplish in the future. I would also like to extend our thanks to Professor Inda Ram Ramnarain, Deputy Campus Principal, for his inspiring words of encouragement and for his unwavering support of our academic community. I also take the opportunity to acknowledge the presence of Professor Simongal, Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, who introduced our distinguished guest speaker. I express heartfelt gratitude to our specially invited guests for their presence here tonight. Your support and encouragement meant a lot to us. A special thanks to Mr. Adil Vidal for his outstanding performance on the pan. It was truly mesmerizing and added an extra, extra element of cultural vibrancy to the event. We would like to express our appreciation to the audience for their engagement and participation during the question and answer session moderated by Dr. Monica Davis. Your thoughtful questions and comments are the depth and perspective to this event. Our appreciation also goes out to members of the UE St. Augustine community who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event a success. Once again, thank you all for joining us tonight and making this professional inaugural lecture a memorable and successful event. We look forward to future events and continued collaboration of this nature. Thank you. So as we come to the end of the formal program, I once again want, would like to thank our featured speaker, Professor Sa. Let's put our hands again together. This evening, professorial lecture is the last for this academic year, and there will be several more professorial lectures that we will be having in the coming academic year. Before I bring the session to a close, I'd like to invite all to join us for refreshments outside in the foyer, and you'll be guided by the ushers. A reminder for Professor Sa, his family, acting um, campus principal, dean, as well as other members of staff to join us for a photo shoot, and a very pleasant evening to everyone, and thank you all for attending. I now formally bring this session to a close.